Good day. Yesterday, a disproportionate part of my video was taken up with a discussion of what was going on in Herson region, all, uh, all um, driven by the fact that the flag of the Russian Federation had disappeared from the building of what was said to be the regional administration in Herson city and which was taken to mean by various people, both on the Russian internet, the Ukrainian internet, and as we'll discuss in a moment, the Western media, as a sign that the Russians were pulling out of Kherson region. The hours passed, and it turned out that Russian flags were there on all of the other official buildings in Kherson region, and there didn't seem to be any sign of any sort of Russian pullout. A few hours later still, the regional administration explained that the building in fact was empty, that it had never been used by the Russian um, authorities after the Russian army um, arrived in Kherson back in March, that it was the building of the former Ukrainian administration and that it had been mothballed. The Russian regional administration was located first to a small town on the west bank of the Dnieper River but also in Kherson region which by the way was recently shelled by the Ukrainian forces using high Mars missiles and now to another town, a rather bigger town on the shores of the Sea of Azov. And that's all the explanation we've had Meanwhile, the deputy governor, Russian appointed deputy governor of Kherson region, Kirill Strimusev, has been making more statements um, which appear to imply that there is no plan for a Russian pullout from Kherson region, but that he does expect fighting in Kherson region to resume at a much higher level of intensity within one and a half to two weeks. And some of the words that he said might suggest that he expects the fighting to reach the outskirts of Kherson city itself. Though I have to say, his comments have been so confused over the last two days that I wouldn't necessarily assume that to be the case. Anyway, this has been a very strange incident and I'm not going to pretend that I have uh, managed to work out exactly what is or is not going on. The appearance of disappear or disappearance of a flag is not, I would have thought, in and of itself a particularly significant event. Um, as a commentator on one of the threads to my preceding video um, said, um, I think a correctly said, a lot of the reason for the sort of feverish speculation um, revolving around the presence or non-presence of a flag on one building is because of the shock that still reverberates after the effect, the events in Kharkiv region back in September. And here I'm going to say again that the Russian deception um, over the course of the events in Kharkiv region, we can see the kind of effect that it's having now. Because people were led to believe during the Ukrainian attack on Kharkiv region that Russian troops were rushing to the rescue of the embattled Russian forces in Balaklia and Izium and Kupiansk, whereas in reality the Russians were um, already had already made a decision to pull out of Kharkiv region. So the result is that people now realize that the Russians can withdraw from territories and that they don't always tell the truth or the full truth about what they're going to do. And with respect to Kherson region and its future, Russian statements have been Delphic to say the least, ambiguous, difficult to decipher. And I have to say, um, 
confusing, I suspect, to Russian civilians and to the Russian military who are present in Kherson region and who are supposed to be defending it. On that front, it has to be said, however, that fighting did take place along the front lines in Kherson region yesterday. There were more attacks by Ukrainian forces, not in large numbers, but in any event, in every single case, the Russian forces in Kherson region repelled the attacks that took place. Now, I'm going to venture my own view. I think that this has all just been a mix-up. I don't think there was any intention yesterday to withdraw from Kherson region. I think this has all been a muddle. Uh, and um, I think that probably the flag was taken down by somebody who took the decision to do to take it down simply because the building is indeed empty and because the regional administration withdrew uh, to the East Bank um, more than a week, last week um, in connection with the Ukrainian missile attacks on her son city. All the indications leading up to this strange event have been that the Russians are reinforcing in her son region, that they're deploying more troops there and troops that are more heavily equipped than the troops who were there previously. And there's even been reports that the Russian forces in her son region have actually doubled in number over the last few weeks. Now, I don't know whether that is true or not, but I'm not going to let myself spend much more time discussing an event which seems to have been caused entirely by the presence or absence of a single flag. Now, I will say that after all this frenetic discussion <clears throat> in the Russian um, internet and media, um, the Western media unsurprisingly took up the story and there's been reports today, um, very confused reports in the Western media, especially the British media, with speculations about whether the Russians are indeed uh, uh, staying in Kherson region, fortifying Kherson region, preparing to make a fight there, or whether they are in fact pulling out. And it's been quite curious to see the confusion that exists there. Though, of course, always there is behind it all the hope that the Russians are actually pulling out. Well, all I will say about that is that, as I said, the the facts at the moment don't really support that theory. By the way, the US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, somebody whom I've never thought myself, came across to me as a, shall we say, the sharpest knife in the drawer, found himself uh, dragged into this whole affair. And he was asked um, a question about what was going on. And he came up with a somewhat I thought incoherent answer saying that um, the Ukrainians certainly do have the capability to take Kherson region and Kherson city and that he eventually expects them to do so. Well, it seems to me that it's the sort of thing he would probably say. I mean, if the US Defense Secretary were to come out and make a statement that the Ukrainians lack the capability to capture Kherson region, well, imagine the sensation that would cause. So I, I'm not putting very much weight on this statement, which, as I said, came out, as far as I can tell, in response to a question. Anyway, that's where we are. I'm not going to waste more time on this incident. Um, if the Russians do decide to pull out, then obviously it's a topic which I will cover. If they decide to stay and make a fight of it, that is something I will cover as well. I'm not on the ground, I'm not able to talk to the people on the ground. The reports that are coming out suggest that the Russians are staying, but as I said, we're getting very confusing signals from um, the Russians.
um, and I'm not going to waste more time trying to unscramble them. I will just add just two other points. Firstly, a decision to withdraw from her song would undoubtedly provoke a massive outcry in Russia itself. And whatever the military logic of it, I do wonder whether uh, the Russian government and the Russian high command would be prepared to face the enormous wave of criticism that would follow. And the second, of course, is that um, the Western media uh, has previously published articles talking about the fact that Ukraine has only a limited amount of time to capture Kherson city, that it has to be captured by the middle of November at the latest, because if it's not, the weather will make an advance on Kherson city all but impossible. And, well, the conditions in Kherson region are now extremely muddy, by all accounts, making an advance on Kherson city every bit as difficult as the Western media said. So, given the difficulty that the Ukrainians are having, if only from the weather, why would the Russians want to pull out of a city that is still well behind the front lines and which seems to be adequately protected? Anyway, that's all I get to say, as I said, about this strange topic. Elsewhere on the front lines, it looks like we are now um, in a stable situation. Uh, the, there's been some... Um, there's been some dis d disputes about what exactly is happening in Ugladar. Um, Boris Rogin, who's one of the most uh, acerbic, but also one of the most astute uh, Russian uh, m military bloggers, says that the Russian offensive in Ugladar has stalled, that the Ukrainians have reinforced, that the wet conditions and the muddy ground make it all but impossible for the Russians at the moment to advance, though he does say that they're holding on to all the gains that they achieved um, a few days ago. Riba takes a somewhat more optimistic view, uh, as did Khodakovsky, the uh, brigade commander that I spoke about yesterday. Uh, Riba seems to think that the Russians are gradually edging forward in Ugledar and in Novo Mikhailovka, um, even though Riba also accepts that the muddy conditions there are making advances more difficult. Elsewhere, we have had no real news as of yesterday on um, what's been going on in Bakhmut, but we have had a fair amount of news about fighting in Kharkiv and northern Donbass, and all of it, again, reinforces the view that the Ukrainian offensive in that part of Ukraine has now stalled, that the Ukrainians are no longer able to, uh, have been unable to advance um, further, and that when they have made attacks, which they've been trying to make, even in these very difficult weather conditions, they've been thrown back with very heavy losses. So stability on the front lines and I'm going to suggest that this is exactly what the Russians probably want at this moment in time. They're still in the process of um, strengthening their forces with the 300,000 men that they called up and this process is far from complete. In fact, it's still only, I would suggest, in its initial stages. And even when all of the reservists, the 300,000 reservists, not all of whom, of course, are, are going to be frontline soldiers, but when all of these reservists are, in fact, brought into the military in, uh, um, in, in the conflict zone, well, um, then, of course, the situation will change. But we're far from that point at the moment. The bulk of them are still going through various forms of retraining and reallocation to 
particular units. By the way, on the question of the mobilisation, just two things. Firstly, I've seen a report that the Russian military initially asked, or actually asked Putin, for a call-up of 220,000 reservists. Putin himself has confirmed in earlier interviews that, uh, and press conferences that he was in fact initially asked by the military for a lower number than the 300,000 he authorised. It's not clear where the decision to call up 300,000 men came from, but I read some I think very, very plausible um, um, analyses of this um, mobilization, which um, suggest that the number of 220,000 was the maximum number that the Russian military is in a position to absorb, given its training systems and the number of units on the front line and that the extra 80,000 plus apparently there's a further 70,000 volunteers will need, to, will need to be processed more slowly. And I think this is probably reasonably accurate, actually. And um, at the same time, since we're talking about the mobilisation, the actual call-up of the reservists has now been successfully carried through. Lots of commentaries about the inefficiencies and the failures of this system, of this mobilisation. But overall, actually, despite some teething problems, it seems to me that it's been carried out successfully. As I said, Brian Boletic, uh, the new Atlas, has analysed this best and described this best. You can see his videos at the new Atlas on YouTube and elsewhere. But um, there have now been further problems, which is that some of the monetary compensations that these reservists have been promised, there's been difficulties processing them. And there's been some protests about this from some of these reservists, and Putin himself has been angered by all of this and by the failure to implement the financial compensation. And again, um, heads apparently are rolling, and work on sorting all of this is being done. Again, given the scale of this operation, these sort of teething problems are inevitable. And I am sure that the Russian authorities will sort this whole thing out. I'm going to say that in contrast to the muddle way in which the Russian military authorities have handled information both during the Kharkov affair in September and in her song today the Russian authorities have on the contrary been extremely responsive uh, and um, transparent about the teething problems involved in the mobilization while this has provided some ammunition if you like for the Western media. Overall, I think this has been a good strategy, a good approach to take. And in fact, the overall indications are from the opinion polling data that the mobilization has been received calmly by the Russian population, the bulk of the Russian population. And that in fact, it might even have consolidated opinion even more strongly behind support for the war. So I think that the Russian military authorities perhaps might want to learn a little bit more from this. Whilst I'm on the topic of Putin, he has now chaired another meeting of the Coordination Coordinating Council. And I'm going to revise some of the views that I had about the Coordinating Council before. I said in the previous videos in which I'd analysed the way in which it had been set up, that though it reminded me of the State Defence Committee that was created during the Second World War by the Soviet Union to basically mobilise and run the civilian economy 
and supervise the home front. I said that there was a difference in that that committee, the State Defence Committee, was headed by the, so by the Soviet Union's leader, Joseph Stalin, whereas this coordinating committee appears to be headed by Russia's Prime Minister, uh, Mishutsin, not by Putin himself. Well, I think it's now clear that Putin is playing a very active role in the, in the committee. And that makes the similarities with the State Defence Committee of the, of the Second World War even greater. I think that, if I can also say, the setting up of, of this committee plays to Putin's strengths. Everybody who has observed the man accepts that he is an extremely good manager and organiser, as is his Prime Minister, Mishutsin, who, by the way, is getting very high approval uh, uh, ratings. And it seems to me that setting up this committee, getting these two very powerful people involved, is probably going to play a significant role in sorting out whatever logistical problems and military production problems that may exist. So this looks like an even more important committee than I had anticipated previously. And I repeat again that just as Stalin basically ran the Soviet air, war effort during the Second World War through two committees, the State Defence Committee, which was the civilian part running the home front, and Stavka, the military committee, um, coordinating the war effort, I suspect that something very similar is gradually coming together in what we're going to be seeing over the course of this conflict. So that's where we are on the military side of things. The Russian missile offensive continues. It slackened off uh, over the previous two days, but we've now seen more strikes, this time with Geranium-2 drones, and probably there will be more heavier missile strikes within a few days as the Ukrainians try to repair whatever damage has been done, which I suspect is going to be extremely challenging. Um, I've discussed this exhaustively and in detail I've spoken about the way in which the Russians playing, are playing a cat and mouse game with the Ukrainians over the course of this missile offensive. I think that we will probably see more coming before very long. Anyway, that's where we are with the um, military developments. As I said, um, at the moment, things are reasonably stable. And as I said, that is probably how the Russians want it. They can induct, they're in, in the process of inducting these hundreds of thousands of troops that are now joining their military. And they will want stable fronts until these troops are fully assimilated uh, at, into the units that are fighting on the ground. Now, on this, I'm now just going to turn to the Ukrainian side of the equation. There's been a very interesting um, report on a rather mysterious website, uh, the provenance of which I have no exact knowledge about, which gives or purports to, to give information about Ukrainian losses. It, it claims that it calculates Ukrainian, the number of Ukrainian troops killed in action as of this time to be 105,000. It says that, it says that it had calculated the numbers to be 67,000 at the time of Shoigu's statement on the 21st of September. Shoigu at that time said that there were it was 61,000, but now 
it says that following certain recalculations uh, and also because of heavy losses Ukraine has experienced as a result of its recent offensives, the total number of Ukrainian losses, and this is killed in action, has now risen to 105,000 from 60 to 67,000 in um, mid-September. Well, I'm not going to discuss that in detail, though I would say that it does correspond with some other information that I've been getting. I, I touched on the fact that I'd heard from a British source about um, the life expectancy of Ukrainian soldiers on the battlefields. But as I said, I don't want to say more about that. Now, perhaps more interesting and perhaps rather more authoritative given my uncertainties about the provenance of this, inf of, of, of this particular source is that it gives numbers for the Ukrainian armed forces. And it says that the total number of people who have served in the Ukrainian armed forces over the course of this war to date, including killed and wounded, and actually serving is around half a million, which corresponds with some of the claims we've been hearing from Ukraine. But it also says that the number of active forces, active troops fighting in the Ukrainian military at the present time is now around 360,000. And that also corresponds with information that I've been getting from other sources. Now, Ukraine has announced a call up. It wants to call up another 100,000 men, though it's information about how that's going to happen at the moment is fairly sketchy. Um, let's assume that these join up with all of the forces that have been, you know, that are still being deployed. That would bring Ukrainian, the Ukrainian active forces to around 350,000, 360,000. I mean, there would be losses, there would be more losses, but anyway, when, for, sorry, 450, 460,000. Now, if the Russians, by contrast, are adding 300,000 men to their forces on the ground, and assuming that their forces on the ground number between 100 and 150,000 men. That is including not just the Russian regular military, but the Donbass militia, the Chechens, the Wagner organization, all of these different groups. Then, presumably, we would also have forces of around 450,000. Now, that means that in a few weeks' time, the Russians will have, for the first time since the commencement of the war, achieved, at the very least, numerical parity with the Ukrainians, or perhaps even superiority over the Ukrainians. And that, it seems to me, is going to change the dynamic of the war. It must do. I mean, bear in mind that the Russians have far more equipment, artillery, machines, whatever. They have a much larger air force, a far more sophisticated air defense system. They've shown that they can launch missile strikes on Ukraine from all kinds of directions and um, can basically reach any part of Ukraine with their missiles. But also bear in mind too, that in every encounter battle that I can think of, that's to say any ba every battle in which Ukrainian troops have fought Russian troops on relatively equal uh, um, uh, numerical terms, the Russians have always won. They won every single such fight. Now, um, obviously, when 
Ukrainians are defending in built-up areas like Bakhmut City, Ugladar, Vugladar, and those sort of places, then obviously they are able to rely on fortifications. But note that apparently the Ukrainian forces defending Bakhmut are said at the moment to outnumber the Russian forces that are attacking Bakhmut and the Russians have been making slow but incremental gains in their advance in Bakhmut. So it seems to me almost certain that this, in fact not almost certain, it seems to me certain that this Russian call-up is going to change significantly the dynamic on the battlefield. And I can't help but think that Western militaries understand this, though I do wonder what they're telling their, um, their Western, the Western political leaders. But <clears throat> um, beyond that, this big call-up and this change in is going to give the Russians options about what they intend to do. And I've seen some discussions about this. Are the Russians will this much larger force, numbering 450, perhaps even half a million men, if we add on all the volunteers and people like that, um, will the Russians launch big offensives, big arrow offensives, as they're sometimes called, or will they continue the war of attrition that they are waging at the moment? Well, I, I'm surprised that this is even talked about because the overall Russian commander, General Surovikin, has already provided an answer to that very question. He has said that he will continue to wage a war of attrition uh, so as to spare the lives of Russian soldiers and Russian civilians. And he has talked about grinding Ukraine, the Ukrainian military, down. Now, let's just go back to this report. As I said, I'm far from clear about its provenance. I don't consider the numbers it's giving to be authoritative. But it says Ukraine has lost 105,000 men, plus or minus 10% since the start of the war. And that is isn't a figure which is not completely out of line. In fact, it's relatively in line with other what has been claimed by other sources. I would stress, again, we're talking mainly about Russian sources, but Ukraine doesn't really provide credible casualty figures. And those who follow the Western media will notice that the Western media, Western governments don't provide those casualty figures either, even though they must have some inkling of what they are. So these Russian figures are the only ones that we have, and they do seem to be consistent with what we can see on the battlefields. Well, if this figure of 100,000 or so is correct, then that's 100,000 out of a total number of Ukrainian troops called up of just under 500,000, or in other words, a fifth of the total. And as I pointed out yesterday, the Ukrainians are saying that they need another 100,000 men to fill the gaps in in their forces caused by the losses that they've suffered, which again seems to corroborate these figures. Well, a fifth of one's army, of one's total military, lost over the course of eight months. It's, if it's true, and I want to stress again, these figures, provenance of them is uncertain they may look plausible, they feel plausible, but you know, we can't be sure that they are correct. But if they are, if they are correct, and if they are the kind of figures that Surovikin is seeing, 
Well, one can see why he is perhaps confident that attrition is the way to success. Now, at this point, I'm going to mention the only war that I've ever studied with any attention, and that was a long time ago, during my um, undergraduate days. I did graduate studies about the American Civil War, or the war between the states, as it's called. And these, I should say that they were undergraduate studies. They were actually at a fairly sophisticated level, um, approaching at some points almost MA or, or even PhD level, looking at a lot of sources um, fairly carefully supervised. And the thing I concluded then, um, and which has stayed with me ever since, though I'm confident I'm going to get pushed back about this, is that what actually decided the war was the attrition that the Union waged against the South in the last year, in 1864. In other words, Grant's famous campaign in the wilderness. And up to then, the US had been trying to win the war through various, through tactical means, but in 1864 it turned to attrition. And eventually, the South proved unable to replace its losses. And it seems to me that Surovikin, I'm sure he's not aware of this precedent, but this is the kind of strategy that he and the Russian leaders are following now. Well, as I said, that's just a historical aside. People can make of it what they will. I expect, as I said, I'm going to get some pushback from that, especially from Americans. But anyway, that seems to me what the Russian strategy is. Surovikin has already said that he's going to grind down the Ukrainian forces through attrition. So there's no point in speculating about this. He's already told us what he's going to do. Not big arrow offensives, but instead, as I said, a war of attrition. The Russians grinding down the Ukrainian forces as they have been doing consistently throughout this war, but perhaps at a much greater tempo with much larger forces executing this and of course eventually the point will come when Ukraine will experience its final military collapse. That's, it seems to me, Surovikin's strategy. By the way, I've just been reading, just before this program, an article in the Chinese English language newspaper, Global Times, which essentially says that that says much the same thing, that the ability of the G7 powers, the Western powers, to go on supporting Ukraine is now dwindling and, in effect, attrition is therefore working. Russian attrition strategy is therefore working. And of course, from Surovikin's point of view, and this is where, by the way, is very different from what happened um, in 1864 with the US, but from Surovikin's point of view, the advantage of attrition is that it conserves his forces. It limits the casualties that the Russian army will suffer. Big arrow offensives, as was explained in a live stream that we had with Scott Ritter um, on the Duran. Big arrow offensives involve heavy casualties, even if they do produce quick and apparently decisive results. An incremental attrition strategy on the contrary, what it does is that it conserves your own forces even as it grinds down your opponents. And the Russians, it seems to me, are putting everything in place to do that. Now, 
let's move forward to other things. And I'm first of all going to talk about the economic situation. And we've now seen interests rises in interest rates in the United States and in Britain. There's been some pushback in both countries against the interest rate rises. In my opinion, whatever grand strategy some people think the Fed, the, the Federal Reserve Board is following, in my opinion, the central banks have no real option now but to raise interest rates. Whether or not raising interest rates reduces inflation may, may be debatable, but in the event that the central banks do not raise interest rates, uh, the markets and economic actors will assume that central banks have given up on inflation uh, that they expect and are willing to accept much higher rates of inflation than we have already. And for that reason, the central banks, whose job it is to try to protect the stability of their currencies to the extent that is possible, have no real alternative now but to raise interest rates. And of course, this is increasing. It's piling on the economic pressure because m across Europe, certainly, and I expect before long in the United States as well, we're going to see pressure grow for a fiscal consolidation. In other words, for budget cuts. So all of the indicators are now pushing us firmly in every part of the West towards inflation, uh, towards recession. And the Bank of England yesterday spoke about the longest recession that Britain has experienced since records began. I think that means since records, modern records began in the 1950s, but I'm not absolutely sure even about that. Anyway, Britain is obviously very badly affected, but the country that is perhaps in the most tragic position is Germany. It's become increasingly clear that the German economy, which continues to have a much heavier industrial sector, much bigger industrial sector than other Western economies, that it had become that it has met, been able to grow and, uh, and, and succeed economically because of the cheap energy it's getting from Ru it was getting from Russia and because of the linkages, the economic linkages, the heavy trade that it had developed with China. Well, the Germans have probably forever lost the cheap energy from Russia and what we're hearing is that more and more German companies are starting to close factories in Germany because they can't afford to keep those factories running whilst um, energy costs remain so elevated. Well, Chancellor Scholz of Germany has tried to preserve the other side of the equation, he's gone to China and he's now had a meeting with Xi Jinping. And it's a very interesting meeting and I'm going to now discuss in a moment the Chinese readout. But I should say that Scholz's visit to Beijing, his meeting with Xi Jinping, has come in for significant criticism in Germany itself from the Greens and from others like them who say that Germany should basically trade with countries, should not become dependent on trade with countries that do not share its values, which is a very ideological <laughs> approach to trade, if I may say so. Um, but it's also coming in, f Schultz is also coming in for criticism from unsurprisingly from the Anglo sphere, from the Americans and the British, who want dividing line, dividing lines 
between the collective West and China, and who do not want to see this trade with between Germany and China continue. Anyway, I thought I would read some parts of the readout, the Chinese readout, that followed the meeting between Scholz and Xi Jinping. I'm not going to read the whole readout, which is huge, as Chinese readouts always are, but some parts of the readout were extremely interesting. For example, there was this line. President Xi stressed to Chancellor Schultz that political trust is easy to destroy but difficult to rebuild and that it should be nurtured and protected by both sides. He cited a quote which former German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt used and which he also appreciated, that's he appreciated, that political leaders should have the serenity to accept the things they cannot change, the courage to change the things they can change, and the wisdom to distinguish between the two. Now, I can't help but think that those words contain a hidden rebuke about the way in which Germany has wrecked its relationship with Russia, the way in which Germany has exploded its long-standing relationship. It's tried to change Russia or compel Russia to follow German ideas. And here we see C talking about reminding Schultz about what was said by another German chancellor, a chancellor from Schultz's SPD party, Helmut Schmidt, a chancellor, Helmut Schmidt, who played a big role in developing trust and strong relations with Russia, saying that leaders need to have the courage to accept the things they cannot change. Anyway, she then went on to say, it is important that China and Germany respect each other, accommodate each other's core interests, adhere to dialogue and consultation, and jointly resist disturbance from block confrontation and attempts to see everything through the prism of ideology. Now again, C is talking about relations between China and Germany here, but one can't help but feel also that there's again a hidden rebuke about the way in which Germany, under Schultz's leadership, has mismanaged relations with Russia. Because C would say, probably didn't say it explicitly, but the implication is that the Germans failed to accommodate Russia's core interests in Ukraine, they disregarded its red lines, they did not adhere to dialogue and consultation, and they, instead of resisting disturbance from block confrontation, they remained loyal to the block they belong to, which is that of NATO, led, of course, by the United States. And with all this talk about Germany not becoming dependent upon for its trade relationships with countries that do not share its values, that it's come to see things, everything through, at least in relation to Russia, everything through the prism of ideology. So it's a warning not to do the same with China that they've done with Russia, but it's also, it seems to me, a rebuke to Scholz, to the Germans, for the way they've destroyed their relationship with um, Russia by disregarding, throwing away realism, and instead conforming with block confrontation strategies and ideological perceptions.
And then we have some actual comments about Ukraine itself, the Ukrainian crisis. And the Chinese readout reads as follows. The two leaders have also exchanged views on the Ukraine crisis. President Xi reinforced, reaffirmed China's support for Germany and Europe to play an important role in facilitating peace talks and to build a balanced, effective and security architecture in Europe. Under the current circumstances, the international community should support all efforts conducive to the peaceful settlement of the Ukraine crisis and call on all relevant parties to remain rational and rec exercise restraint and direct engagement as quickly as possible and create conditions for the resumption of talks. Well, <laughs> again, that seems to me to be an implied rebuke because at the moment the Western powers are taking, including Germany, are taking no step at all to facilitate peace talks. On the contrary, they are supporting the policy of Ukraine to achieve victory. So, C is in effect telling Scholz, your strategy in Ukraine is wrong. <laughs> and um, he then goes on to say that they should all oppose the threat or use of nuclear weapons, advocate that nuclear weapons cannot be used and that nuclear wars must not be fought and prevent a nuclear crisis in Eurasia, work together to keep global industrial and supplies chains stable and forestall disruption to international cooperation in energy, food, finance and other areas and con consequent damage to the global economic recovery. And note the references to avoiding disruption to institutional co international cooperation in energy, food, finance and other areas and again that seems to me to be a not too subtle hint that the entire economic war this war of economic attrition that has been waged against russia is completely wrong so a polite lecture from xi jinping to olaf scholz to the germans telling them look you've completely messed up on Ukraine, don't even think of trying to do the same to us. If you do, it's not going to turn out well for you. And in the meantime, your responsibility is not to make the situation in Ukraine worse by pressing on with your policy of confrontation and block discipline and all that, but on the contrary, to try to take steps to achieve peace, to Persuade Ukraine to sit down and negotiate with Russia, as Russia has repeatedly urged Ukraine to do, but as Zelensky is currently refusing to do. Well, one wonders whether Schultz, who, as I said, also doesn't strike me as the sharpest knife in the drawer, understood all these very nuanced and subtle but fairly clear points that Xi Jinping was making to him and if he did what he felt about it. My own view is that Schultz is trapped. He failed to assert himself at the beginning of the crisis. He made an extraordinarily maladroit trip to Moscow in which he failed to uh, reassure the Russians and act as a bridge between the Russians and the Americans over Russia's security demands and uh, um, requests for security guarantees. And he then allowed himself, after the conflict began, to be propelled into an economic war of attrition, which is causing massive damage to the German economy.
and he's looking for a lifeline in Beijing but what he's getting is a lecture there even whilst he has the Greens and the Americans and the British baying at him demanding that he take now a hard line with the Chinese. Rarely has a leader of a big country messed up as completely. I think Schultz has some sense of this, but I get the sense that he has no real idea of what in this situation to do. Anyway, I found it an interesting readout. I'll, we'll see whether or not the Germans, or at least Scholz, are able to learn the lesson and whether Scholz is in a position now to face down the Greens, at least on relations with China, and what happens next. This is the point where I'm going to finish today's video. Again, I've been talking for almost an hour. And just to remind you once more, you can find us on Locals, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram and Rockfin. Uh, you can support us via PayPal, Patreon, not PayPal, Patreon and Subscribestar. Uh, you can also, should also think about going to our shop and buying the great things that you will find there. And last but not least, please, if you've liked this video, don't forget to press the um, like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again and more from me soon.